Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday on the Stoop, a poem is a room you may enter with an open heart with Amy Beth Sisson. Amy Beth Sisson is struggling to emerge toad-like from the mud in a small town outside of Philly. Her poetry has appeared in Cleaver Magazine, Ran Off with a Star Bassoon, The Night Heron Barks, and will appear in River Heron Review. Her last day job was in software development. She told programmers what business people wanted and business people why they couldn't quite have it. In fall of 2021, she started an MFA in poetry at Rutgers Camden. Uh, her website is amybethsisson.com, and I will drop that in the chat, as well as if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be in the little box um, for you to check out. Other than that, Amy Beth, please take it away. Welcome everybody to our Zoom room where we will have um, hopefully a welcome space to be with poetry. Um, the idea for this class came to me because so many of my friends, I, it's not really a class session, um, time to be together. Um, it came to me because some of my friends said to me, I don't really get poetry or I don't like poetry, um, but it's for poets and non-poets just sort of to think about ways to deepen our relationships with poems. Um, we have a pretty big group, so I think I'll ask people to go ahead and put in the chat um, your name, your location, your pronouns, um, and an encounter you have with a poem or a poem that's somehow um, stuck in your mind, either in a positive or a negative way. Um, it could be from childhood, it could be something recent, whatever, whatever you feel like bringing to the group. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a little story. I um, just went to Vermont and stayed with a friend of mine and her 90 year old mother. And um, her mother was asking me about this class. <coughs> so I uh, told her what it was about. And she said, oh, when I was in high school, and she went to this little tiny high school on Martha's Vineyard. Um, they read a Wordsworth poem about daffodils. And she went to the teacher after class and said, um, I just don't get it. I don't get poetry. So the teacher said to her, well, during study hall, you have to write an essay on the poem. So I think some of us were schooled out of loving poems and also schooled into thinking that um, a poem was something we had to evaluate or explain instead of something that maybe we would want to just be with and appreciate. Um, so I am going to, oh, we're getting some great poems in here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, oh, actually, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a link um, that is the, the presentation that I'm working from. So if any reason you can't see the screen, you can follow along. Um, So just to get really basic, um, but to ask sort of an impossible question to answer um, is what is a poem? And a poem, Alyssa Gabbard, who's been doing some wonderful columns in the New York Times um, said, a poem is any word composed in lines. When you write in the line, there is always an awareness of the mystery of what is left out. By mystery, I don't mean metaphors or disguise. Poetry doesn't or shouldn't achieve mystery only by hiding the known or translating the known into less familiar language. And I've been involved in an organization called ModPo, which is University of Pennsylvania's modern uh, poetry um, class. It's a free class on Coursera. Um, run by Al Phil Rice, and it's a great space to get together with people and talk about poems. I talked about it this summer, and a poet I know said, oh, well, some of their um, analysis of the poems are terrible. And I, I thought, well, 
it's great because everybody's talking and they're sharing ideas about poems. And I sit and watch the discussions thinking, oh, I disagree with that, or I really agree with that, or I think differently. And it's just a way to bring more minds into the, um, the endeavor. So Alphil Rice um, runs that and he says, poetry is when how you say it is as important as what you say. So I think one thing that really helped me to be with poems is to think that a poem is not a puzzle to be solved. Um, and Matthew Zabruder, um, who's a poet and editor and teacher says, to truly experience poetry, we need to try to just be in the poem for a while, maybe even having unfamiliarity, resistance, not understanding at times mm -hmm. pass through us, yeah. which is hard for me at least as it might be hard for you. Um, also poems can be a process of unfolding, one that might welcome us or maybe grudgingly allowed us, allow us to be inside it. Poems do not have to be all about the revelation, the learning at the end. They aren't necessarily goal oriented. If anything, they are more like a conversation with a friend. So, I'm just checking the chat for a moment. Oh, thanks for reposting the question. Um, so the next thing I just wanna mention is we live in a magical age. It's hugely problematic, but there's so much poetry because we look at, it's problematic because we look at our screens too much, but um, to look at your screens, to find poems online and actually hear poets read their own work to me is magic. Um, and I find listening to be one of the most powerful ways to be with a poem. Um, another, sometimes people talk about accessible poems and difficult poems um, or confusing poems. And a couple of people in the chat have talked about feeling confused by poems. And this concept might be a part of what you're experiencing. Um, so Lynn Hajinian, poet and critic, wrote an essay called The Rejection of Closure. And in it, she says, there are open poems and closed poems. She says, a closed text is one in which all the elements of the work are directed toward a single reading of it. Each element confirms that reading and delivers the text from any lurking ambiguity. An open text, in contrast, is open to the world and particularly to the reader. It invites participation, rejects the authority of the writer over the reader, it speaks for writing that is generative rather than directive. And as someone who writes poetry, this is a little bit scary to me because when I write a poem, I'm welcoming all the readers in, um, knowing that they're going to bring all of their associations and resonances when they read my words. Um, and it might take me to, or it might take my words to a direction that I hadn't even thought about. Um, but it's when I'm reading poems, I love that this is allowed to me. This is, I'm given permission to be in that space with the poem. Um, so just for an example, I'm going to give you a, um, close an example of a closed poem that actually I find really delightful. Um, so this is, I think Hyginian makes it more of a value judgment. You know, she really rejects the closed poem. I don't feel that way about it. Um, and I feel that an open poem can be a, um, an effective poem. So here's one that's loved by my children. And I think I need to share 
the audio. I don't know how to do that. I think you have to unshare it. Oops, sorry. Okay. I don't know if it's not letting me share the audio because I'm playing it in a window. No, you should have, but you have to stop share, click the stop share. And then I think when you, you need okay. to redo it with the sharing the audio. That's a guess, but. Okay, ah, okay. I may be sharing just the idea, but let's try it. The other day, as I was ricocheting slowly off the pale blue walls. Um, can you guys hear it? Okay, I'm gonna go back just a tiny bit. The other day, as I was ricocheting slowly off the pale blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one if that's what you did with them, but that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. <laughs> she nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, and then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim, and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here I said is the lanyard I made at camp. And here I wish to say to her now is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. Okay, so do I win something? That was the poem that I said was close to my heart. So. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Yeah, I see some wonderful poem um, suggestions in there. So I hope for people who shared the um, Jane Kenyon poem um, that Autumn shared is a wonderful one. Uh, the Langston Hughes, um, Lucille Clifton. We have some wonderful um, suggestions in here. Um, so let me share again.
Okay, can you see my screen? Okay. Um, so here's an open poem, um, one that doesn't lead you to such a clear understanding, perhaps. Um, do we have a volunteer to read this? And if you could use the raise hand function in the screen, because I can't see everybody. Okay, Katie will read for us. Okay. What is the current that makes machinery that makes it crackle? What is the current that presents a long line and a necessary waste? What is this current? What is the wind? What is it? Where is the serene length? It is there and a dark place is not a dark place. Only a white and red are black. Only a yellow and green are blue. A pink is scarlet. A bow is every color. A line distinguishes it. A line distinguishes it. Okay, so I'm going to not ask you to explain this poem to me. Um, and I'm instead what I'm going to do is just continue on. I'm just gonna sort of leave it there to resonate with you for a bit. Um, and we're gonna talk about some things to look for when you're in um, with a poem. But first I'm gonna mention that um, a poet in reaction to Gertrude Stein said, um, but can I specify anything beyond the sounds? To use a phrase that I first heard from Spencer Holtz, it gives the sensation of meaning. Um, and I always really like that because I think it says something about the difficulties of communication and language and the feeling that we understand each other and the feeling of meaning that we sometimes have. Um, and I think it also gives a sense of why Gertrude Stein is so difficult for people. So I'm gonna talk about some concepts from a poet named Gregory Orr who wrote, I think this was in the seven, 1970s or 80s, um, a very influential um, essay on the four temperaments of poetry. Um, and I came to this through uh, Era D. Matthews who is poet laureate of Philadelphia and is one, is one of my teachers. Um, so she, um, she, she gave me this image. Um, Orr's four temperaments are story, structure, music, and imagination. And you can imagine the left hand quadrant as sort of the open and fanciful, I mean, no, I did, I can't tell my left from my right. The right hand quadrant is open and fanciful and expansive. The left hand is constraining um, and provides boundaries for the poem. And Orr said that the best poetry involves all of these quadrants and to be effective a poem should participate in one from the left and one from the right. Um, he also said that the um, poet who achieves all four is Shakespeare. Hmm. <laughs> so um, story is dramatic unity, you know, the Aristotle thing, beginning, middle, end, conflict, dramatic focus, resolution, um, and please also, I forgot to say, jump in and stop me if you have any questions. Structure can be form, such as a sonnet. Um, you know, so it's 14 lines. It has a very particular rhyme scheme. Um, it has a couplet at the end. A couplet is just two rhyme, two lines in a single stanza that rhyme. Um, 
And he says, the satisfaction of measurable patterns, it is akin to higher math, geometry, theoretical physics, the beauty and balance of equations. Um, he talks about closed structures, which are things like the sonnet and open structures, which are just stanza patterns. Um, and lately poets have invented new structures and, or also um, taken some of the standard structures and played with them. Um, so Diane Seuss just published a book of sonnets that are all 14 lines. The lines are all different lengths. Um, well, their lines are pretty consistent lengths within each poem, but some of the sonnets have extremely long line lengths. They don't rhyme. They don't have the couplet, um, but they're 14 lines and she's calling them sonnets. And that still is structure in Orr's um, definition. Music, rhythm and sounds, syntax, the syllabic qualities of English, pitch, duration, stress, loudness, softness, and alliteration, assonance, consonance, internal rhyme. All the sound things that make up the music of the poem. And imagination, which is just the flow of image to image or thought to thought. Um, it can be a stream of association. It can be concrete images or abstract ideas. Um, so D. Matthews disagrees that only Shakespeare <laughs> brings together all of these. And um, she points to those winter Sundays by Robert Hayden which is a really beloved poem by many poets I know. I think some people in this room, we've talked about it before. Um, would anybody like to read this one? Maureen, are you volunteering or do you just have your hand up from before? Sorry, I'm volunteering. Okay, great. <clears throat> Those winter Sundays. Just a minute. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Thank you. Um, lovely reading. So I kind of want to free associate with you guys and I'm going to stop the share so I can see the chat more easily. Um, people want to speak, just speak up. Um, that's welcome. Or if you want to put things in the chat of other ways to be inside a poem. Other things you look for when you're reading a poem or that resonate with you besides story, structure, image, and music. Memory. Memory, good one. I would say emotions, how the poem makes me feel. Cool. I think this is related to imagery, but I think there's also um, to imagination, I guess is how is juxtaposition, how, so it's a kind of partly structure, part image, but how images relate to one another. 
either in a dissonant or um, assonant way, but that there's, um, so I guess I look for those juxtapositions that can either be harmonious and, um, or take me, take you to surprising other places. Good. The relevance or connection to my own life. Good. Appearance. Appearance on the page, how the lines are breaking up. It's a little bit of structure, but also it gives you a visual. One that often strikes me that's related, I think, to story is time, how the poem moves through time. And I love that people are saying emotion. I see a couple of people chiming in on that. Um, because it's not, a, it, that's about the reader. And um, one of the things that I'm hoping people will come away with today is just permission to be in a poem, again, without judgment or evaluation. Um, so one of the things that I find very interesting and gives me permission to be in poems in a new way is I notice a lot of poems written in response to poems. Um, so one that I saw recently or last year was um, Diane Seuss. Um, wrote a poem called Gertrude Stein. Would somebody like to read this one or should I try to get the audio to work? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing then because that seemed to work last time. Gertrude Stein. Can you hear it? Okay. I just brushed the dog there on the dog's couch. I was wearing a black, well, to call it a gown is a criminal overstatement, a black rag. It became clear to me, and when I say clear, I mean the moment went crystal cathedral. I could see my life from not a long shot, but what they used to call an increment apart, a baby step to the right or left of myself, about the width of a corrective baby shoe. There I was, broad-shouldered, witch-shaped without the associated magic, with my dog in my shack. Once mauve faded to pink, beyond sex or reason, a numbness had set in. Gertrude Stein, Picasso's portrait of her, that above it all, or within it all, look on not a face, but the planes that suggest a face. The eyes aren't really lined up right, or the real eyes are peering from behind the cut-out shapes of eyes. The couch had been a sort of, not a gift, but a donation of sorts from a person with plenty of money. When it was dragged into my house, it was already stately, but with worn patches and stains. A trinity of dogs over time had laid claim to it, three egotists. To brush the dog meant I had to visit it in its monarchy. And in that visit, that single prismatic increment, I saw I'd become 
Maybe all arrive in their own time, some before dying, some after. A draped artifact, haystack or headstone rising out of the plains. And then with fascination and a degree of sadness and even objectivity, I loved as I once loved tender buttons myself. Any thoughts? I just really love the way it went from like these shots of, of seeing herself and her life to these tiny details. I'm curious how it re or how it hears <laughs> for people who feel like they're struggling with poetry or aren't used to listening to it or feel like they have a lot of meaning. You know, it's a long poem and it's and it's um is that hard to listen to and do you feel like you can hang on to it? Here, I'm sharing it so you can see the stanza structure and you can see what it looks like on the page. Um, well, I guess I'll not completely answer that, but I feel like it's was, um, you know, compared to the Gertrude Stein itself is it's much more of a story and it's much more of a voice of a, you feel the poet as a, person and you actually see her, I mean, at the end. Um, so it's almost like she's filling in some of the missing pieces in Gertrude Stein. Um, it's interesting at the end, she says how much she loved the poem. She once loved the poem that we had read before, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't come in until the end. There's a, I like the, I also like the dialogue having just read tender buttons with the poem where in the beginning she's she's measuring herself against Gertrude Stein um she's not an adequate she doesn't her her hers is not a gown it's a rag what she call it um so but it, it just to me there's just so much more story and so much more um of a, a visual element um she also brings in it's ecrastic she brings in the the portrait of Gertrude Stein, as well as the poem. And it's almost like it gets to the poem near the end. So it's almost, it's interesting. It's almost like it's, um, how would I say it? It's like demystifying without explaining, but it's sort of demystifying in a way that she's saying, I can be even more mundane than Gertrude Stein and get you to a deeper, more emotional place, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. I think she she is echoing. They're both very voicey poets, if you know what I mean by that. Like they, I feel like you hear them speaking. Um, I see people saying that their mind meanders when um, poems are long, and that that happens to me too. Um, ideally, I. I should have figured out how to have both the, the screen up and the words, because I find that if I listen while reading, it helps my focus. Um, although sometimes just having the words wash over me can be effective. And then, you know, I can, one of the things is even a long poem is usually not that long. Um, so I can give it the time of multiple readings. Um, Any other reactions to this poem? Yeah, one thing, I just am really fascinated by the idea of writing a poem as a way of being with a poem. So we have enough time to do some writing and um, what I'd like to do is give you a writing prompt and send you off for 10 minutes. And it's going to be two, a two part um, 
exercise. So I'm gonna put these in the chat, but I selected some poems for you to choose from, or you should feel free to choose the poem you mentioned earlier in the chat or um, any poem you're interested in. And I included the Tender Buttons, um, a long dress poem. Um, and then first, I just want you to free associate on its temperaments, list your thoughts, um, and um, we'll come back in 15 minutes um, and well, let's say 10 minutes. So we have time for the second part. Um, um, sorry, I can't. Okay, so I hope those links work for you. Um, that's a collection of poems that, you know, mostly are pretty firmly in the, the canon um, that you can choose from or choose your own poem, free associate, write down anything from our discussion, from Orr's um, temperaments, um, emotion, juxtaposition, connection, appreciation, appearance, time, memory, anything we talked about, anything else that comes up for you. And we will come back at 4.50.
we have about one more minute. Okay, let's um, put down our pens for a moment. Um, I'm resharing the presentation in case people didn't get the link earlier. Um, I won't leave it up forever, but you can get to it there. Um, the second part um, is to give you guys some time to take that information and write either a poem or an essay. I know this is not nearly enough time, but to start on a harangue, um, whatever you would like to write in response to the poem you chose. And I'm going to give you um, also, a collection of poems that were written in response to some of the poems that we selected. So you can see um, Allen Ginsberg wrote a poem in response to um, Walt Whitman. Divya Victor wrote a very different kind of response to Walt Whitman. Um, so you don't need to read those now, but you might want to peruse them. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't do the best time management, but um, why don't we take five minutes to just do a little bit of taking your thoughts in response to the poems and using it to start something. As I said, a poem, a harangue, a letter, um, another poem. And we'll catch up at the end and people can share their thoughts and questions. So we'll meet again in five minutes.
Okay, um, let's rejoin and catch up for a minute. We just have a few more minutes left. Um, would anybody like to share either some words from the exercise or reactions or thoughts about ways of being with a poem? I just want to say it, it's really cool to think of all these ways to, to look at it. I haven't thought of them before. Thanks, good. I, I wouldn't mind reading what I wrote because it's a little different. It was funny. I mean, I thought I would be responding to the imagery, but I responded more to the poet and the theme and wrote about, it's more of a portrait of someone who I know who loved this poet. It's the Sylvia Plath, Lady Lazarus. Oh, great. It's not a real poem yet, but it's a, an egg-shaped room, a yellow lantern hangs like a yoke, a young woman reading, seething unseen, her underwear always matches, death, death draws her like flame, her feet swathed in rabbit skins, gin her favorite poison, drunk to the insipid sound of wings, and you already famously dead, her favorite poet, because you hate like she does. And then um, I went on, but that's how far I got. Great. I love the egg yolk. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you really picked up on both imagery and also sort of an imagined emotional response. Like you, you're- Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a portrait of someone I knew that would have imagining her emotional response. Yeah. That was sort of a poem about another person who liked that poem a lot. I don't know what you call that, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and there's a poem um, that doesn't have a link because it's not published online that I included in my presentation by um, Linda Norton. I think I forgot to put her name on it. Um, in response to the Lady Lazarus poem as well, um, as well as Sinya Karras's, um, what it was it called? I didn't know Lady Lazarus. I forget the exact title, but yeah. So a lot of people responded to that poem. Um, so another way of being with a poem is to think about the lineage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wanna share a little bit? Oh, I see Lizbeth has a hand up. Hi. Um, I was just going to add that I, I, I didn't really write anything that I want to read per se, but just the idea of saying that somebody is little neck clams, I, I, it just stuck in my head. And I did start writing about eating clams in the summertime, um, but also just kept thinking about like, well, what does that like, it's not a compliment. It's not the worst thing you could say, but it's really doesn't seem like a compliment either. And um, I was just thinking about, you know, clams and what they, the, the uh, what do you call it? It's a euphemism, right? Mm -hmm. um, for sure. But then also, <laughs> I don't know, it just stuck out to me. Which I, you I, mean like you denote? their denotation or is that what you were trying to no i'm just saying it's oh. like a, euf a euphemism for you know uh sex yeah genitals of a woman but at the same time it's just it really stuck out to me like if i was going to write more on this i would be writing mostly about the clams <laughs> Also, can't wait to read the um, the response poem, but I didn't get to that yet. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So we are right at five o'clock. If anybody has something quick or questions, or you can hang on another couple minutes. I just I just wanted to say that I gave myself permission to not understand the poem. So thank you for that. Oh, good. <laughs> it really helped. Oh, good. Great. Did you find you enjoyed it more? I did. 
I did. I wasn't struggling to, to understand every line. I just went with it. Oh, good. Yeah. And, you know, they're short, so you can go back and maybe, you know, come come back to it and see what you find next time. Yeah, I read it four times and every time I would get a little more and a little more. Great, lovely. Okay, and I think Ashani would like to close us out. Yes, thank you so much. This was a great session. It was wonderful to hear all of your thoughts and also to hear all these great poems just read out loud. Um, really fantastic. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I put our reminders back in the chat about our classes and events and our feedback form, um, and I hope that I'll see you all next Wednesday. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Amy. It was great. It was really